Okay. So, so then moving to the, the parsimonious doctrine, uh, is this, would you call this your, your constructive take on this? Yes, I suppose it is my constructive take. Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, I don't know whether parsimonious is the best term for it, but that's the term I came up with at the time. But yes, it's a kind of it's kind of a, an attempted middle way, but it's it's obviously closer to the middle model than it is to the the kind of high octane or strong version. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, on this, then God is is he's metaphysically simple, but not absolutely myriologically simple. Right. Exactly. Can, can yeah. you parse that out for us? Sure. So uh, he's metaphysically simple, by which I mean he is not composed of more fundamental parts. Mm -hmm. So here's an analogy. We might think of souls, whether you think we, there are such things, just, just go with it. Um, mm -hmm. We think of souls as metaphysically simple in the sense that you can't chop a soul up into more fundamental parts, right? Right, right. Or um, in physics, you know, physicists tell us that subatomic particles are metaphysically simple in that they can't be broken down into more fundamental parts. I mean, they have they have distinct properties like spin and mass, but you can't chop them up into smaller parts. And that's why subatomic particles are the sort of fundamental building blocks of, of the material world. Right. Uh, at least that's, you know, that's the story anyway. Yeah, today. Um, yeah. So, right. So... Um, you might say that just as a subatomic particle is metaphysical, as a metaphysical simple, it can't be broken down into smaller parts. And just as a soul is supposed to be a metaphysical simple, it can't be broken down into more fundamental parts. So similarly, God is metaphysically simple in the sense that he can't be broken down into more fundamental parts. So that's what we mean by this kind of metaphysical simplicity claim on, on the view that I'm, um, I'm, I'm outlining. Mm -hmm. So, um, so how would that differ from, so, so God's not absolutely myriologically simple, though. So, no, it's not absolutely myriologically simple. So, in a similar way to the subatomic particle, you might say the subatomic particle um, can't be broken down into more fundamental parts. So, it's metaphysically simple, but it does have different, distinct attributes that, that mm. we ascribe to it, like its spin and its mass. So, it's not absolutely myriologically simple, right? Because it's got properties that are distinct. Yes. Um, and what I'm suggesting on this um, way of thinking about divine simplicity is perhaps we can ascribe that, that sort of way of thinking to God. Now, with this important caveat, though, mm -hmm. okay, so yeah. let the reader beware. Okay. I am not saying that the, the parsimonious doctrine is the truth of the matter. I'm mm -hmm. not saying this is the right way to think about God's nature. What I'm saying is it's a kind of model um, it's a kind of simplified description of more complex data. That's what a model is in the sense that it's used often in the sciences today. Um, and you use a model like your model of an atom in a physics textbook in order to get some kind of conceptual grip on something that's really complicated and perhaps we can't get a grip on if we looked at it in its full complexity. Mm -hmm. The model helps us to get a kind of um, picture in our minds of what this thing is. And in a similar way, I'm suggesting that with respect to divine simplicity, the parsimonious doctrine may help us to get a conceptual grip on something with respect to God that doesn't have the costs of the strong doctrine and will give us a workable account of divine simplicity that we can use for the purpose of theology. And that's, that's itself a useful thing. It may be, though, that the parsimonious doctrine is not the truth of the matter, all things considered. It may be the strong doctrine is the truth of the matter, all things considered. But if the parsimonious doctrine enables us to do our theologizing with a with a view that has less uh, metaphysical costs or complications than the mm -hmm. strong doctrine, then it may have a kind of theologically pragmatic use, even if it's not strictly speaking the truth of the matter. And my thought is this: God is mysterious. Perhaps we can't get a very good conceptual grip on the simplicity of the divine nature. Um, perhaps there, there will always be problems besetting the sort of strong doctrine of divine simplicity that we can't figure out entirely, even if it's the truth of the matter. Yeah. So maybe we're better off working with something that's um, that's got fewer costs, metaphysically speaking, and that may be just as useful to us to do our theologizing, even if it turns out that it's only a proxy for the truth of the matter, a bit like your physics textbook um, picture of an atom is not actually what an atom looks like. Nobody's seen an atom, but it's a proxy for an atom, and we use it for certain um, helpful purposes in in pursuing science. Yeah, uh, I I love that depiction. I think that's really helpful. Um, 
and I think it's really it's it's really modest as well, or it's really um, yeah. You don't you're not trying to get out over your skis here, and right. you know this is exactly what it means. Uh, and I'm I'm wondering, uh, do we have anything more than models? Does everything come down to models? Like, is the is the maximal doctrine also a model, just a stronger conception yeah, that, of a model? Or what do you think on that? Question. That's a good question. I'm not sure that all the historic theologians who went for something like the maximal model thought of it. Sorry, maximal doctrine. I should say thought of it as a model. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly do think that uh, the the notion of models culled from or taken from the sort of philosophy of science is a is a helpful um, way of thinking about a lots lots of different things in theology and might well um, enable us as theologians to make certain sorts of progress in in rather difficult um, theological uh, problems that have been um, been besetting theology for some time. So I, I think that it's got some value the, yeah. the language models. I'm not sure I would want to commit myself to the view that everything boils down to models. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I'd want to say that. But I do think that, um, that that the language of models and the concept of models has a certain theological utility that um, the kind of work that I'm involved with when I do analytic theology um, particularly prizes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, it reminds me of, of like C.S. Lewis's conversation of this where he talks about maps. He talks about like, you can look at a map of the ocean, but it's different right. than experiencing the ocean itself. I think right. that's 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 also very helpful to yeah. To think about. That's exactly right, and I think that's that is a that's a very good way of thinking about it. You know, I mean, you you use maps for certain purposes, even though we know that they're proxies for the truth of matter. Yeah, um, we know that, but we don't think, oh, therefore, it's a, this map is a waste of time. We think it's a proxy and it serves certain purposes, and for those purposes, it's a good thing. Yeah, right? yeah. And we don't confuse the map with the sea. Right. Right. Um, so yeah. that's kind of what I'm suggesting we, we do with respect to this thorny question. Okay.